look for cross-border collaborations in the year ahead. Uh, as the Korea biopharma industry matures, opportunities are increasing for cross-border collaboration and investment to accelerate drug development. We have a great panel here for you today. Um, given that we only have a short amount of time, though, I, I, I thought we would skip the introductions and I would introduce uh, each, each panelist as we go along. Um, I'm Jeff Cranmer. I'm an executive editor at BioCentury, and I'm sitting in the United States where we have a new president today. And so I thought that it would make sense to head to Washington for our first question to an alum of FDA, Becky Wood. From your perspective, Becky, on Sidley's Global Life Sciences Leadership Council and leader of its DC healthcare and FDA group, as well as former chief counsel at FDA, what are your expectations for the Biden administration in terms of policies that might affect Korean biotechs, the Korean life sciences ecosystem, and cross-border deals? Well, Jeff, it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Thank you very much for the invitation. We, of course, are watching all of those issues very closely for our Korean clients and for all of our clients who are FDA regulated or interested in becoming FDA regulated. And it is of course very timely that we're having this conversation today. There are seismic political shifts underway in Washington DC today. Of course, America inaugurated Joe Biden as a new president, bringing a democratic administration to the executive branch of our government. Um, and what that will mean is of course, political appointments at the helm of all of the federal agencies that regulate the life sciences industry, including FDA, as well as a new democratic Congress, which is gonna have a lot of implications in terms of investigations and focus going forward in the next couple of years. And as you know, the conventional wisdom is oftentimes that democratic administrations tend to be somewhat less friendly to industry uh, and innovation than Republican administrations, and also more pro-regulatory. But I think the landscape is much more complex than that. Um, so we're going to see some significant changes overall, I think particularly in the tone that we see from this new president and this new administration. But I think people would probably be surprised that there's also probably going to be a lot more continuity than you might expect at FDA itself. I think it's important to remember that FDA itself is a science-based organization. It regulates about 25% of the U.S. economy, including, of course, biopharmas and medtech. Um, and it is largely led by a really established and well-regarded set of career personnel. So all of the heads of the different device, biologics, and, and drug uh, centers at FDA, our career personnel have been there a long time, um, and they are not changing. So there is also going to be a continuity story that we're watching very closely. You know, FDA operates very much like an independent agency. It is tasked with, you know, imposing Congress's mission and making sure that the products that it approves are safe and effective. In the last year in particular, I think we have seen um, significant concern in many quarters that the president and HHS were perhaps interfering or trying to interfere with science-based decision-making at FDA. And so you're seeing in reaction to that, even today as priority point number one for the new Biden administration, I think a real focus on a new tone um, and they have talked very much about listening to science, ensuring that public health decisions are informed by public health officials, and promoting trust, transparency, common purpose, and accountability for the federal government. So I think you're going to see a change in tone. Frankly, in the day-to-day -day work of the career personnel at FDA, things may not change as much as folks think. And I want to focus on a couple of things that I think are, are pretty interesting. So, of course, um, COVID is a number one priority um, both at FDA and uh, for the new administration, a continued rollout in what has really been an extraordinary, unprecedented effort to bring vaccines to market at lightning speed. So new vaccines, new therapies, um, new diagnostics uh, to make sure that you detect, treat, and prevent the spread of COVID and also focus, of course, on personal protective equipment. All of these things have an FDA regulatory component. We're continuing to see a lot of questions from clients about how to successfully navigate the emergency use authorization process at FDA. Um, 
and obviously a, a, a focus as well, we think we're going to see from this administration on science, elimination of political influence, they say, uh, enhanced transparency, they say, um, and continued regulatory flexibility, which has, of course, been a hallmark of FDA in recent years since the 21st Century Cures Act, which really put a focus on modernizing the way FDA regulates um, in order to speed the marketing of important new products. Um, so that sounds in some ways quite similar to the Commissioner Gottlieb and Commissioner Hahn FDA, um, but I think a real change in tone from the top. Um, there's also, of course, been a focus on COVID as a catalyst for moving really important policy initiatives and regulatory flexibility, and we're continuing to watch how that affects non-COVID therapeutics development. And so, you know, just to name a couple of examples, um, you know, in terms of the use, comfort around the use of real world evidence, comfort around enhanced flexibility for clinical trial and digital health. Those are all things where the, the agency has been somewhat reluctant to jump with both feet. And COVID has, I think, really encouraged novel thinking and practical thinking that will inert to the benefit of all innovators um, in the system. Uh, in terms of novel therapies, of course, the 21st century cures gave FDA these new authorities. FDA has already stood up a framework for being more nimble in how it is uh, regulating, providing for accelerated approval of really important therapies for novel and rare diseases in particular. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, FDA put out its scorecard for 2020, and it, it actually approved as many novel therapeutics last year um, as it has for the last several years, it's a second um, to the record in new, new therapy approvals. And the FDA also at CEDAR, the drug center, uh, met 100% of its user fee deadlines, which is fairly extraordinary given the press of work um, with respect to COVID. Interesting thing about that is though, we heard from a lot of clients that felt like they were getting less robust in interactions on complicated questions with the agency agency was more apt to perhaps issue complete response letters where it had questions. So a little bit of two sides of that story, I think, as you think about innovation. Gene therapy, another issue we've been watching very carefully. FDA, of course, stood up a framework for modernizing that. We've had the first gene therapy approvals when I was at the agency a couple of years working with Scott Gottlieb and Peter Marks in developing that framework. Um, and we're seeing a lot of focus on gene therapy and particularly challenges around safety. We've seen clinical trials stopped. We've seen challenges with scalability. So folks focused on that are obviously very concerned about continuing um, to have flexibility in those areas uh, and also the support they need in that incredibly complex but incredibly curative and, um, and innovative industry as well. For drug pricing, that is obviously an issue that got a lot of attention um, from this administration, a lot of attacks on pricing, efforts to allow the importation, which is a new thing of drugs from Canada, for example, and personal importation. And the Biden administration has said you know, that, that drug pricing and bringing that down continues to be a major effort for them. We also are watching very carefully what may happen on the compliance and enforcement front, which when you're innovating and you're getting into a market can seem like it's an awfully long way away, but it's a very important area when you're doing diligence to figure out, you know, what are the potential problems and what you might be buying or starting. Um, so that's been an issue where we think we're going to see as FDA opens up um, inspections out of the U.S. to manufacturing facilities we're going to see more emphasis on that. And of course, a bad inspection can derail uh, an FDA regulatory approval. Um, as you think about longer term risks to business, we're also looking um, in this administration for a resurgence of enforcement, particularly targeting alleged COVID related fraud, warning letters for overly aggressive promotional practices. That has been uh, in particular the latter, a hallmark of democratic administrations. I think we're going to see more of a return to that um, as we look forward to to what's next. Um, and finally, I'll leave with congressional investigations, you know, and having an aligned Congress and administration, both of the Democratic Party, you're apt to see a lot more investigations, um, possibility of CEOs getting hailed in front of Congress for uncomfortable questions, and a real focus in particular on um, perceived fraud and abuse with respect to COVID countermeasures and COVID response. So fascinating time here in Washington and a lot that we're continuing to watch. Excellent, thank you for that very uh, detailed response. And uh, the points on uh, cell and gene therapy were quite interesting as we have uh, 
Kun Wu Lee on the panel, as well as BJ, BG Re, uh, who are both uh, working at companies that are well versed in uh, one or the other of those areas. Um, and you did mention, um, you know, it's changing, but it's not changing. I, I just wanted to point out that uh, on that note, uh, the Biden administration announced today that Janet Woodcock, who is the long longtime head of CEDAR um, at FDA, will be the acting FDA commissioner. So in a way, consistency. Uh, good to see at FDA. Um, let's, let's dig right into uh, cross-border deals. I'd like to turn to BG in Korea, um, the CEO of SCM Life Sciences, um, no stranger to cross-border deals. Uh, BG, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for Korean biotechs as they look out, outward to form cross-border deals in the year ahead? Right, year, year 2021 and the year ahead. We have we two have big two issues. issues. As Becky and mentioned, mentioned, there's one is COVID-19, and the, the other one is uh, the Biden care. So for COVID-19 case, Korea did an excellent job. For the diagnosis kit, we have more than 70 companies manufactured the diagnosis kit and uh, exported 50 mil more million kit to 110 countries. Also, with combining with Korea's good uh, IT system, we did a good job for the tracing and the prevention for COVID-19. Uh, Korea also shows we have a good uh, health hospital system, and we can conduct excellent clinical trials. And for Biden care, maybe biosimilar will be one of the part, and Korea is globally number one in biosimilar industry. In Samsung and the Celtron, they are expanding their uh, uh, CMO capacity from currently uh, around 50, 550,000 liters to 930,000 liters. That's mostly you know, the biggest capacity in the world. So we can utilize this kind of thing. So in the coming years, Korea bio industry can be much more active for cross-border uh, uh, partnership. Also in the novel therapy area, Korea is very much focusing on regenerative medicine, including cell therapy and gene therapy. Also, we are working for microbiome area and the exosome area. So that you know, Korea can go globally compared to other industry. Oh, Korea has always some kind of uh, discount for cross-border partnership because it, uh, we have a small market and the bio industry was not great uh, industry for Korean uh, Peninsula. So uh, we are aiming, we want to become uh, maybe hub for the Asian territory. The Asian market will be growing dramatically in the coming years and try to uh, become a hub of the Asian territory for later. So Korea has a lot of you know, uh, good opportunity for this coming years and we hope you know, we can catch that. Chris, do you want to jump in there? I know that you've been watching investments uh, in U.S. companies. You can speak to um, investments in Korean biotechs as you are a partner of Novatio Ventures and managing partner at the Korea Seoul Life Science Fund. Uh, so curious to hear your thoughts there. So uh, uh, with uh, given the backdrop of what we all had experienced last year, it obviously was the worst year. But in terms of biotech equity market, uh, it turned out to be the best uh, year for both Korean uh, domestic market as well as U.S. Uh, venture uh, community. And uh, what I see is that uh, uh, given the fact that uh, in, in Korea, South Korea, the venture investment in biotech has actually over the five years, last five years has increased uh, by uh, fivefold. So that's a significant uh, increase in VC funding in Korean biotech, domestic biotech. But uh, what has uh, happened is, uh, as far as I know, to my knowledge, there is a very, a very small, almost non-existing amount of uh, US VC invested in Korean biotech companies over the last few years. And 
And uh, our Korean fund actually has been kind of unique in a way that uh, two of our portfolio companies had successfully uh, attracted VC investments from very marquee, very well-known uh, US VCs. So that was unique, but ever since it sort of dwindled, uh, what uh, the US VC investment in Korea has, has become diminished significantly. And I see that as a uh, potential opportunity where it can be uh, sort of brought back because uh, as you are probably very well aware, uh, US VCs, especially early stage focused VCs uh, tend to be very uh, hands-on. So, so there may be some, some conflict, uh, cultural conflict if US VCs were invested in the Korean company, but what US VCs in exchange bring is a uh, very significant level of experience and in helping the company realize uh, 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 its R&D, long-term R&D strategy. So I think there's a, a significant benefit of having uh, partnered with US VCs. And also uh, US VCs, as you know, uh, really tend to gravitate toward uh, uh, high risk taking. And, and with a lot of money that's available from LPs nowadays, they actually, their appetite for risk taking has, uh, uh, significantly uh, improved, and and I think if U.S. VCs were to invest in Korean biotech companies, I think that provides a very positive uh, signal as to the validation for the company's underlying technology and uh, management. And I would also say, uh, perhaps lastly, uh, the Korean biotech companies, uh, so they are very self-sufficient in a way that. Korean capital market has been such you know such a lucrative and active over the last few years. Companies were able to uh, raise money and go public, and 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 as a result, you know, management you know ha has done well you know in terms of you know exit and all that. But uh, again, what what uh, you what uh, you should not really uh, lose the focus of is the fact that biotech R&D strategy is global. So in order to uh, realize your uh, global vision, which I know that a lot of Korean biotech companies uh, have, is one of the way to realize that is partner with US VCs. Uh, thank you for that, Chris. Uh, Kun Wu, uh, I saw you nodding along there. Uh, uh, your company, uh, Gen Edit is based in the Bay Area. I believe you're just across the Bay from me right now. And you attracted a Korean investor, uh, SK Holdings, as the lead for your seed round. Uh, I believe you have a couple of other Korean investors. Um, what resonated with you uh, that Chris said there? Nope. I believe you're on mute. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank the organizers inviting me and giving me a chance to speak with this wonderful panelist and i have nodded a lot i mean like things like things that i have heard so far from the becky and vg and chris and especially like the parts that chris has mentioned there are different values that u.s investors bring compared to korean investors and all different like all different opportunities like kind of too many of the entrepreneurs who are running the company, I want them to deeply consider that. And Genetic, in our case, we were very fortunate to have both of the both types of the investor investing in the company and adding value to Genetic. Maybe sharing a little bit of like our story, how the company was started, and kind of company was started with a technology discovery at UC Berkeley, and the very initial seed funding came from Sequoia Capital. And the bow capital, bow is backed by University of California system, and with those money, kind of we have built started the company, and additional investors kind of join our our round, which was like Data Collective Bio and SK Holdings, and that was the first time we got the Korean investors' money into our company, and kind of we haven't publicly disclosed disclosed, but in our Series A round. We have brought many fantastic investors, like help of the kind of investors from US side and help of the investors from Korea side. We have built like really great, like kind of syndicate of the investors there. And 
So in this like kind of environment, there were like lots of things that we have like kind of seen, and there were parts that was like significantly adding value. As Chris has mentioned, U.S. investor has like like kind of takes risk in the technology that is like in all this stage, and there's like help the company build the technology further, and there's at the same time like Korean investors like are like kind of very supportive of the leadership team and then like talk with the direction and then support the companies like making continuous progress. So there are kind of multiple parts that we are seeing and maybe just adding a little bit kind of more of the like kind of story to it so that as many of the entrepreneurs are in this kind of in this like Zoom setting because kind of in this environment, like kind of bringing many different investors, kind of very important part for us, like building a relationship and kind of really knowing and also like knowing each other and telling the story that we have and sharing the data that we have like collected. So that was like kind of very important part for us. And yeah, regarding the difference of the US investor and the Korean investor, yeah, like when I have chance, I will talk more about it. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm curious, um, perhaps this is one for Chris, but I, I know BG and, and Kun Wu have had experience here, and I'm sure Becky can probably just answer just about any question given her, uh, her the depth of her experience. But if you are a Korean biotech and you want to get attract U.S. investors, um, what do you need to do? Is it advantageous to establish a U.S. subsidiary? Um, what, what advice can you give to uh, Korean biotech that's looking to attract U.S. investors, get a, get a start in the U.S. market? Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll go. Uh, so I guess two things go hand in hand. Uh, obviously, it's it's underlying science and and the management team. And as as mentioned earlier, uh, US VCs tend to take a lot more uh, scientific risk. So if you have a truly a breakthrough innovation that you can you can showcase, uh, obviously that's going to help a lot. And management and team. So. Uh, so this advantage of being in Korea and wanting to raise money from the U.S. VCs is the fact that uh, your exposure, your visibility in U.S. is inevitably is low, and that that's something that you have to overcome. So you know some biotech companies come here to open up an office and and you know start you know one of the goals that they want to accomplish is uh, relationship building, and I think that's important. But I think it's even more important that uh, if you as a biotech, Korean biotech company want to come to U.S. and open up an office, I think there has to be more uh, practical and operational and substantial rationale as to why you are doing it. And meaning that you are doing it in order to ultimately uh, accomplish, help accomplish uh, your uh, strategic R&D uh, long-term goal. And if and and by definition, once you accomplish that, I think you will become more robust Korean biotech company in U.S. And that, that will in return help attract uh, U.S. investments. Excellent. Well, we just have a few minutes left, unfortunately, as this is an excellent uh, and insightful conversation. I'd like to head back to Korea to uh, ask BG our final question. Um, BG, um, SDM has expanded into the U.S. and Europe. What what are the advantages of these deals for your company as a lesson to other companies who might want to follow that same path? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we are kind of company, company in the U.S. US. That's for the mRNA loaded dendritic cell cancer vaccine company. Also another company in Italy. That's for allogenic car shy KC9 company. The reason we are quite a company is still Korean biotech industry has some gap uh, for the global standard in CGMP manufacturing and uh, clinical trials at global level. So the reason we are quite a company is we can acquire all kinds of know-how for the manufacturing and the clinical trials by acquiring the companies. So that's good asset for the Korean biotech. We are going to bring that kind of know-how and the information to Korean biotech companies to become the global level uh, standard. 
So that's one of the main reasons, and we got you know, this kind of thing very easily by acquiring the companies. Excellent. Well, I think that's all we have time for. Um, actually, I want to throw in one last question. Uh, uh, this was one question that came from one of the companies who's joined us, and I'd like to go back to Becky. Um, one question was very specific about IP. Do you have any advice for Korean companies looking to patent their IP in the U.S.? Yeah, it's a great question, and it, it can be a neglected area. And I would heartily encourage people as part of their initial team to, in addition to getting your regulatory consultants, also make sure you have an IP patent lawyer as part of your team. And I think another thing that's very important to understand in the US system is that in addition to the patent law protections, there are also certain protections that are offered as a matter of FDA law. Um, where you have, for example, an orphan or certain innovations. Um, and those requirements are exquisitely complex, but essentially they can stop, as you know, another company from having their application reviewed by FDA for a period of time. Um, and sometimes those things are neglected until um, later in the, in the day, and that may, may reduce the amount of opportunities you have for planning. So um, I would definitely think about those those things proactively from the beginning and figure out how you fashion your patent and exclusivity portfolio along with the other important decisions about how you're gonna what track you're gonna do at FDA. Excellent. Well, well, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to keep us on time here. I'd love to hear more from all of our panelists. Um, but now uh, I'm gonna say thank you for all your insights and to everyone who has tuned in around the world. Now I'd like to hand the microphone back over to BG, who will lead the company introductions. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Jeff.